Colleagues and friends, uh, we resume our series of online events with the usual very warm welcome to tonight's linguistic flash mob organized by the Linguistic Aperitif Group. For the beginning of the fall, we have thought that addressing very general topics uh, which are of common interest might be a good addition uh, to the program, uh, which will go back to its usual narrow syntax oriented topics uh, from October on. Today, we have invited two very prominent neuroscientists, David Purple from the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics from Frankfurt, and Andrea Moro from the Instituto Superiore Ius uh, Pavia. They will discuss a very general topic, which is language and the brain. And as usual, they will exchange ideas and give us their view in the form of a contest. They will answer three questions offered by the moderator, Maria Teresa Guasti from the University of Bicocca, Milan, and have five minutes each to give us their answers to each question. At the end, the moderator will summarize and comment the results, and then we open the discussion, which will include questions both from Zoom and from YouTube. For security reasons, the chat, microphone, and screen sharing functions will be disabled during the debate, but the chat will be active at the end for you to write if you intend to ask a question and we will enable your microphone in due time. Those of you who won't be able to ask their question can send it to me via email. I will collect the questions and send them to the speakers for a later reply. The event is being streamed on YouTube. So if you ask a question, you are giving in your consent to be streamed and recorded. Please feel free to distribute the link of the YouTube registration you have received with the flyer to students and colleagues and post it on social media. And now I leave the floor to Teresa Guasti, who will moderate tonight's epic battle in linguistic history. Good afternoon or evening to everyone. So I will start by a brief introduction of the topic and uh, of our hosts. So in the past flash mobs, as Cecilia was saying, we have heard discussion on the structure of language. However, language, which is a behavior that we all can observe easily as we use language, functions the way it does because it interacts in complex way with our brain. It is constrained by our brain and constrains the brain itself. In the last decades, research at the intersection of theoretical linguistics and cognitive neuroscience have massively contributed toward the definition of a plausible architecture of the brain, the different contribution of the left and the right hemisphere, and neural processing underlying hierarchical linguistic structure and speech perception. This progress has, made, has been made possible by collecting converging evidence from multiple sources based on solid behavioral tasks, imaging, and physiological data. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting two among the most important researchers who contributed to this scientific process. Both discussants come from a strong formal linguistic background. David Purple, while a PhD student, worked on language acquisition at MIT. And Andrea Moro, while a PhD student, worked on the verb B at the University of Venice. Both have worked extensively for many years on the relation between language and the brain, addressing different specific questions, 
Andrea Moro's fascinating work on impossible languages has shown both our flexibility and our tuning to specific features when it comes to language. David Pöppel, in his groundbreaking work jointly with ECOC toward a functional neuroanatomy of speech perception, which celebrate 20 years this year, proposed a functional model of speech perception in which both hemispheres contribute, but in different ways, according to the dorsal and ventral fusion of neural networks. It is not easy to translate a linguistic uh, question into a question that can be investigating looking at the brain. And many details still need to be defined in order to fulfill the so-called linking hypothesis between neurobiological primitive and linguistic primitives. For example, how can we investigate the temporal dimension of language, namely the fact that language unfolds in time what can tell us more studies on the relation between language and the brain in the next future? And what can we gain that we couldn't gain otherwise by looking at the relation between brain and language? This is more or less what we are going to discuss today. And so we can start with our first question. Is the hierarchical structure of language linked to the functional or anatomical organization of the brain? And uh, I give the floor to Andrea. Do you want to start? Um, whatever. Yeah, thank you. And just since it's five minutes each, I have um, time over here, but in case I exceed, just tell me. Um, I'll stop you. you. What? I'll stop you. Oh, you'll stop me. First of all, thank you. Thank you for this invitation, for all the fantastic words. At first, I thought you were speaking about David and someone else, and then I realized I was the other invited. Um, and it, it would hardly be um, a contest in the sense that I, I take David's work as a guideline in all my own work. And in fact, part of the answer to the first question um, relates to his work. The first thing that I would like to highlight on the first question is that it's not at all um, um, uh, um, straightforward what we mean by hier hierarchical structure of language, especially if you access the literature of the neurobiological world. There are at least two different domains. There is one domain in which hierarchical structure is meant to be a kind of order in which the modules come up in deciphering or, you know, emitting um, a linguistic structure. So in that case, in fact, David's work was, uh, you know, uh, seminal in understanding that you literally start from phonemes and you go up to syllable structure and then to the other structure. This is one sense in which you can think of hierarchy. That is, you have different modules and then they are organized in such a way that do not intervene all together, but they come up. And of course, this is constrained by the brain because of the fact that the signal is physical and it has to go through a path in the brain that goes through the ears and, you know, the circuit, there's a tonotopy uh, characteristic. And of course, there is the other um, uh, meaning of hierarchy, which is the one in which all our group of formal linguists have a lot of interest. It is the hierarchical, hierarchical in the sense of output of recursive, because of course we know that there are hierarchical structure like syllable structure that are not recursive, which is actually interesting. In this second case compared to the first, it's very hard to have an a priori reason to admit that the hierarchy of the linguistic structures is imposed by what you say the functional or anatomical organization of the brain. It could well be that in a possible world, we had grammar that, you know, just, um, you know, were based on linear order. Why not? I mean, there is no anatomical, physiological, or perceptual reason why that can be the case. But if this is so, then the role of linguistics becomes central. And this is one of the um, 
leading one of the transversal, let's say, uh, argument that I will use to answer all the three questions. That is, you cannot even pose these questions without choosing um, a theoretical framework. In this case, uh, in the case of the hierarchy in the sense of in the sense of hierarchical structure, um, in the sense of recursive structure, uh, that the answer to the first question can only be empirical. And in fact, um, it's linked to the answer to B and C. In other words, it is surely the case that in linguistics up to the first half of the last century, linguists were not at all convinced that the lingu that ling language structure was biologically driven. And it was only because we had a strong theory that on the basis of comparative results assumed and of you know studying error that kids make when they learn their own language, that we could assume uh, one a priori reason to test the brain. And this is the reason why if I had to answer question A, refer not to the modular construction, but to the, to the hierarchical construction, I would say that the answer is both yes, but in the second case is yes, only because we were able to choose between two, let's say, equivalent competing theories by uh, exploring the reaction that the brain had with respect to different stimuli organized in the two different ways. I don't know if I already exhausted my minutes, but that's more or less what I want. Yeah, to say. more or less. Yes. So, uh, David, it's your turn. Okay. Uh, also, thank you all for organizing and for showing up. Um, I was having a pretty relaxed time, and then I just noticed that uh, both Ken Wexler and Alec Morantz are in the audience, who were my bosses in graduate school. <laughs> so now that makes me incredibly tense and nervous. So this is like some kind of weird late exam, like post-graduation, like, you know, post-publication review. Uh, so, I, but I, I'll try to recover from the shock. Um, the so with respect to the question of you know hi hierarchical structure, where is it a function of the anatomy and physiology of the brain? The answer is uh, yes. What else would it be? So where would it come from? Unless you either say it comes from some other organ, the kidney say, I'm gonna reject that hypothesis, or you say it's some external thing uh, that comes from an analysis of the input because you're an empiricist, in which case it's a property of e-language. And of course, all the people here would in, run away in shock and horror if I said you're working on e-language. So, uh, it has to be that it's part of the mind and brain. It's a property that the instantiation of hierarchical structure is a property of the mind and brain. So for me, the question is a little bit more specific at this point as an experimentalist, which is, are we talking about the more narrowly linguistic conception that is aspects of structure dependence or dominance relations or things where we invoke uh, structural relations over hierarchies? And that is a more narrow conception in which case we really have to be parochial and study only human brains. Or is, are these actually notions in which we, if we decompose them carefully, uh, they may share certain attributes with other aspects of the mind and brain, maybe planning, maybe motor control, I don't know what, in which case we can look for some guidance and some inspiration at other systems. You know, plan so I'm thinking of action systems in which there's also interesting structural relations between things. So. The short answer is, if not from the structure and physiology of the mind and brain, you're either going to have to be an e-language person, which we don't want, or a mystic, which we also don't want. So if you want the kind of naturalistic experimentation, you should look to the, to the brain. And the only thing you have to answer for yourself is narrow conception or broad conception where we decompose it and can study it in different preps. That's all I got. When Thank you very we, much. What, when do we interact, Teresa? Uh, after. Now, I think, uh, now we have the question, then there will be the, well, I don't know how much interaction between the two of you, but uh, <laughs> then there will be the, the question of the, 
uh, of the public. So uh, maybe yeah. during the question of the public, you can a little bit interact, but uh, uh, would, not now, I would say. Not now, okay, all right. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we move to the second question. What can different techniques uh, tell us about language processing and structures? And this time, maybe David will start. I mean, that's a, you know, sort of just an occasion to speculate, right? This, uh, I mean, it's a pretty broad question. So by techniques, I assume you mean, on the one hand, uh, the recording techniques or, you know, the, the experimental techniques we can use in, mm -hmm. in the studies of the human brain, and I guess experimental approaches more broadly. I mean, the, so here I am sort of a, a naive optimist so, you know, I spend a lot of my time whining and complaining about how terrible the techniques are to study the brain because they're very low resolution and they're crappy cameras that take a picture from far away. And, you know, uh, that being said, it's amazing. It's an amazing fact of the matter that we can record brains from far away and within you know, the level of a centimeter and a millisecond see what's going on. So then we have to ask our questions scaled to what we can measure. And so if that is the resolution of your methodology, can you ask a linguistically interesting question with that methodology? So you might think, well, that's too coarse. I'm interested in, you know, I don't know, pseudo reduplication in Tagalog to pick an example I recently heard from a friend called Alec. And um, that's maybe, you know, is that too narrow or can that kind of question be translated into a neurobiological question that can be answered with MRI or MEG or ECOG or stimulation? I, you know, that, that's a kind of practical question. And the research program you have to define for yourself is that sort of what level of the system do you think you can pose questions that are meaningful and answerable? And here, so let me go back for one second. When I worry about when we do brain and language studies, about whether are we learning something about the brain, which would be really cool, or are we learning something about language, which would be surprising, or do we learn about nothing, which is what we do most of the time, which is what I call interdisciplinary cross sterilization. Mm -hmm. As we do a kind of mediocre language experiment using coarse techniques, and we've then learned essentially, you know, lame stuff. So you have to make up your mind what you know, want to know something about. Let's say it's about structural relations or hierarchies. Then you better pick your problem and pick it apart in a way that can be operationalized. So here's my bad news. I think linguists, all of you, me included, have been doing a very bad job translating the ideas that have been really helpful in linguistics into actionable experiments. It is actually the exception that somebody sits down and says, how can I turn this into experiment? Forget the brain, just for psycholinguistics. Can I really turn this into an experimental assay or contrast that's going to tell me in a rich and cool and informative way about some theoretical alternative? And yeah. So we shouldn't be whining at neuroscientists, which I also am, that, you know, that we're too naive about linguistics. We should, we should and that's legitimate. And you know, linguists know things that should be taken care of. Likewise, though, you guys as linguists have to do a much, much better job at being clear, transparent, and translating to, experiment, to what could be an experiment. So it's not fair to say, well, I think your experiments are too coarse and shitty. Maybe that's sometimes the case, but then you have to step up and say, here's the kind of question that's theoretically germane, and here's the kind of data that would work. And I think the techniques we now have are good enough to answer some very subtle things, actually. So, but it has to go both ways, right? We can't just whine about the other team. We have to whine about our own team as well and, and really do the hard work of finding what, uh, what was mentioned earlier, what Maria Teresa mentioned, what, what kind of linking hypotheses are there actually? What do they look like? At what level of abstraction are they formulated at? So I'm optimistic, but I think we need a more a call to action that maybe links to, I don't know, to psychology, to computation, to make mm -hmm. things explicit in a way that can be experimented on. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, Andrea, it's yeah. your turn. Thank you. I, I practically again agree with what David said. Let me just try to, um, to see the same situation from different perspective in the following way. What are we supposed to say about the, the correlation between the brain, how the brain works and what we know about language? I used to say that there are two different perspectives. The where perspective, that is where in the brain something happens, and the what perspective, that is what does a, the, a single neuron communicate to the other one correlating to some linguistic fact. Now, um, I, I, I do remember a slide from a, a very interesting talk that David gave some time, uh, some times ago, in where he was kind of dismissing the where problem by saying, well, it's not the interesting question. But on the other hand, in his own answer to the question, he actually mentioned one interesting perspective where the where problem is still interesting. That is when you have to choose between two competing theories. And in fact, again, um, if you think of the history of linguistics in the, in the 20th century, it was not at all clear by linguists, you, you call mystic tendency. Actually, none of the linguists I know of the first half of the, of the 20th century were mystic, but most of them were not considering the, the, the capacity of the brain to come, of oh, sorry, the, the, you know, the linguistic competence to come from the brain, but from social interaction, which is actually not mystic, but neither biological. Now, uh, it seems to me that one case is exactly what Teresa was mentioning, I discussed several times with you. You have to pick up such a broad property that is suitable to contrast in the where perspective, the reaction. I was lucky enough to choose something that everyone here would have chosen in my condition, that is recursive versus non-recursive. If you design a grammar which is recursive versus non-recursive, where does this come from? And we were lucky to find that, in fact, it, the, the brain reacted differently, and then the, the network that pertains to language only answered to the first one. Of course, there is another issue, which is again uh, a tribute to your own contribution in the field, that is the notion of granularity. That is, the where problem is different from the what problem in terms of granularity. Well, I think that in that case, you give too much to neuroscience in the sense that, in my feeling, the idea of granularity is one that says, one of the two perspectives, either the biological, the neurobiological, or the formal linguistics, has primitive elements that are too big to be uh, made, in, you know, to be to correspond to the other elements, the primitive elements of the other one. It could actually be the case that there is no such a reduction problem or granularity problem, but it could well be that they both have to change. Uh, you know, Noam used to say, he used to give us an example of what happened to chemistry and physics, that it's not that chemistry was reduced to physics. It's the, the, the matter of fact is that they both had to change. So my perspective is to adopt exactly what he said. It is, we don't want to know if we have an area of the brain that we use to do this gesture, who cares? We, we want to know how the brain works. And then we have to pose questions that maybe are not immediately uh, onto the neurobiological mechanism, but that show interesting perspective and predictions. Of course, when you go from the where problem to the what problem, you know, things become immensely more complicated. I have one example, but I wanted to save it for the third, for, for the third question. But to summarize, I do agree with you that we have to pose the correct question, not just correlation random, because otherwise we, we just don't understand. We impose our, we, we, we don't reason how our brain, the, the way that our brain does. We have to know how that effect, how that really works. And to do so, uh, there is only one way, that the linguists do not consider linguistic as ancillary to neuroscience and go on in the process of as you know, Jean Perrin, the famous Nobel um, laureate in physics, used to say, we have to reduce what is visible and complex to what is invisible and simple, and that we both have to share this intention, I think. Okay, thank you. And uh, we move to our third and last question, 
And the question is, uh, which is the biggest challenge for the next 10 years uh, and how can linguistics and neuroscience contribute to, the, to its resolution? So Andrea, maybe, and then David. Um, one premise, our community is strong. We know, it's, it's interesting, we know it, it, it's a compact community and we know each other quite a lot. We have to be aware of the fact that we are assisting the same scenario that Joshua Barhilel used to uh, describe at MIT in the 50s. It is with the new um, capacity of machines, we, we certainly have to be aware of the fact that simulate what uh, brain does when we speak and understand what the brain does when we speak is totally different. So one of the things that we have to uh, get rid of is the methodology of the, the, the statistical methodology of engineering and of simulation. Once that is clear, that is when it is clear they want to understand how the brain works and not how we can simulate brain capacity. I can only give you one example, and that's my answer to the question. And that goes to uh, the last experiment I made. I discussed it with David a lot before presenting, in fact, to the journalists. And so you gave me good luck for that. Um, what, it's, it's obviously the case that when, when we, the brain is exposed to a linguistic expression, there is a lot of information going on. Practically, there are, in Aristotelian sense, at least two, sound and, and structure, let's say. So the, the what problem, that is to understand what the neuron says to the other one, uh, boils down at least to separating these two kinds of information. Uh, in a sense, what I did in this experiment was very similar to what was done in, in the 60s uh, when people wanted to say that syntax was independent of, of you know, sound and, and rhythm and whatever it can be more than structure. So the experiment was the following. We used to uh, test uh, the brain reaction to two couple of words that were completely homophonous. Now, since we are linguists, I'm lucky enough to tell you that the words were article, noun, clitic, verb. Luckily enough, in Italian, there is a subset of article which is homophonous to a subset of clitics. So, for example, le chiese literally means the churches or to her asked. And in that case, we were able to, me to measure with stereoelectroencephalography the real um, uh, uh, answer the real electrophysiological answer a reaction to these two different syntactic structure stripping away the phonological information it's a very micro step but it's one that to me shows that the, in the what you say in your question in the next year right in the next 10, ten years, years my dream would be to understand the uh, the way the oscillatory properties of the signal and try to understand if some of the restrictions that we have in syntax come from the, this kind of physical in, in, um, implementation of the signal as opposed to another one. In that, in that case, um, uh, the term neurolinguistics will really become something that is more than a, a, a manifesto or a slogan for the future history. Okay, thank you, David, it's your turn. Okay, so um, at, the, at the prodding or invitation of David Lightfoot, I wrote a paper 10 years ago or so, or I think it was published in 2012, called The Maps Problem and the Mapping Problem, uh, to sort of outline where, is he, the, uh, prog where, where progress could be made. So uh, with the maps problem, I meant with uh, has been discussed, which is what is the sort of anatomic functional architecture of the system? And I have been maybe a little too dismissive of that, as Andrea points out. But that's obviously a very important problem, because we need to know where things are. The brain's a spatial place, and you kind of need to know your way around, right? But what my point about that was it's little more than, let's say, a test bed for further experiments. Once you've established a very nice map of the layout, then you can go in and begin to really try to understand more systematically what's going on. 
The mapping problem, probably not very well chosen uh, terminology, is the alignment problem about the putative primitives that linguists posit and the primitives that neurobiologists posit, right? So if you have a notion like, uh, I don't know, little v, and you have a notion like cortical column, I mean, that, that's an alphabet of the different teams. And the question is, how do you align these? So that's a way for me to think about the problem. So here's what I think is the biggest thing for the next 10 years, uh, where both linguistics and neuroscience need to work and maybe align, which is how are the atoms or primitives stored? It's the single most difficult problem in neuroscience, as far as I can tell, is how is information actually stored? We have very superficial, slightly metaphorical notions of that. So, you know, the connections between cells represent storage. But the fact of the matter is we don't actually have a meaningful theory of um, how information is stored in the brain. Now, we, there's a real opportunity here to capitalize on the amazing cognitive science or linguistic knowledge of the field to define very, you know, very carefully and thoughtfully what are the irreducible atoms what are the atoms of language in some sense in which they could actually point to how one might ask that question for the brain. Since we have a ton of evidence from linguistics, you know, from uh, comparative linguistics, psycholinguistics, computational linguistics, developmental psychology, what might be the primitives, it would be extremely helpful to then confront neurobiology with the question, how would you store that? Not how would you process it? I think we're going to make a lot of progress on things like hierarchical structure, hierarchical structure, hierarchical structure, right. you know, merging. But right. I think we're not yet even close to making progress on how a word is stored if there were such a thing as a word. You know, if you can point to me how a morphine is stored, I will buy you a very good dinner, actually two, and cocktails. Uh, it's just inconceivably difficult a problem. Now, what neuroscience has to offer is you know, beginnings of outlines of hypotheses of how information is encoded, and possibly stored. This is stuff to do with, you know, hippocampal and cortical interactions and so on. But it's an exceedingly difficult problem. And the, the fact that we have, you know, a vocabulary of some tens of thousands of things, and we don't actually know where or how that works is kind of shameful. And it's one of the most exciting opportunities where linguistics could take a leadership role to make progress both in cognitive science, but actually pointing to important neuroscience questions. Uh, but I think it's super, super, super difficult. I think it's the a challenge where both fields could contribute and should, and uh, that's you know, let's go to it. Okay, thank you very much. Before moving uh, to the question from the public, uh, I will briefly summarize uh, uh, what has been said. So, concerning the first questions. Uh, one uh, uh, issue that came out uh, is the definition of hierarchy, uh, narrow or a broad uh, uh, conception of hierarchy. And in this respect, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, let's say, the, these two concepts uh, uh, are tied to the idea, for example, that recursivity can be found not only in language, but also in other system. And uh, David mentioned actions. And uh, uh, well, language is also uh, an action because uh, it uh, is uh, produced through some articulator. And uh, certainly there might be some uh, connection between uh, hierarchy in language, uh, and the, the broad and the narrow conception. So concerning the second question, the techniques, uh, uh, there is optimism that uh, if you can uh, uh, formulate uh, the correct question, the techniques uh, are available. Uh, of course, uh, there is uh, a need uh, to be explicit, to be uh, a clear question and the correct question. So uh, that's some an effort that uh, has to be done on the part of linguists. And finally, uh, concerning the, uh, the next future uh, and the problem for the future, uh, well, one uh, uh, problem is uh, how the information is, the linguistic information or the primitives uh, of language are stored. And uh, the other point uh, is uh, uh, the reference to the oscillatory properties uh, of our brain and the tuning of our brain to language. Uh, 
And uh, with that, uh, we can uh, uh, move to the question period. I already have a question uh, that was sent to me uh, before uh, uh, the talk start by a person who was unable to attend. And uh, uh, his name is Alessandro Tavano. And the question is, uh, did you, I don't know, one of you, <laughs> Did you ever measure the effect of a purely abstract representation in the brain data you collected so far? That's for you, Andrea. Uh, no, why is that for me? Because I don't know how to answer it. So. Yeah, me neither. I mean, collecting data from the brain, what, what does it mean? It's, it's, uh, it's a good I don't have, a, uh, I can only read the question. I don't know. Read the, la the very last thing, the very last thing. Well, Let me, did you uh, ever measure the effect of a purely abstract representation in the brain data you collected so far? You see, I don't know. It's already out of reach. I mean, science can only move with simple things and measurable things. There are so many words that to me are unmanageable in experimental ways, representation, concept, abstract. I cannot even think of designing an experiment. I mean, are you asking me if I can think of a trinity and see what happens in my brain? Who cares? I hope the, the Pope is not connecting via YouTube now, but um, if, if so, really, who cares? Uh, we have to go step by step, actually, you know, uh, David was referring to the storage of mor morphemes. This is this is to me again one of the one of the crucial aspects. The only thing that I would add, and of course, we that's a, a preliminary question to that kind of question that the person posed there. But the, the crucial thing would be to to ask if the brain recognizes things that are primitives as isolated from the operation that they are affected by. This, to me would be a crucial step to make, because maybe not. Maybe it's the, the same thing that happened to when people try to define the notion of words in, for example, yes person, and had to go to the notion of sentence in order to get that meaning. So it could well be that looking for the list of morphemes as for, as for looking for the, the list of abstract concepts doesn't make any sense. And by the way, that I agree with David that I cannot really answer to that thing, but not for bi neurobiological reasons, but for purely. I guess I, can, I mean just to give a very uh, you know maybe it's maybe it's too pedestrian, but to try you know a very simple simple-minded way mm. to try to do that is to say, can I measure something that's demonstrably not in the stimulus? Right, so can I step away from some uh, correspondence between what is in the environment and what is internally constructed that then has new properties? And for me, maybe this is just too banal, I don't know, but is a, a good example is the, uh, you know, the famous McGurk effect. You see the video of one thing, you hear an audio of a second thing, what you actually construct is a third thing, and that third thing has properties that were neither in one nor the other, and actually yield a different kind of representation for the next computational steps. So it's abstract in the sense that it's you know stripped away from the input array, whatever it is, and then you do. So, so I don't know if that's what the question had in mind. Maybe this is a bit too simple-minded, but um, it's you know it's it's fair to push us a little bit on these issues. And I don't have a. Mm. So I, I've tried to do experiments where we measure consequences of structure building by sort of embedding things so that you know the brain activity tracks tracks parsing in a very specific way so i can track different levels of abs of abstraction in that sense so i can track the stimulus i can track you know phrasal level things i can yeah. track your units uh, but of course i'm using tricks uh, yeah that make it so that it is actually part of the stimulus. So it's maybe not really abstraction in the strict sense that the question that Alessandro Tavano wants to know. So there is actually one little thing. Well, maybe, maybe we can move because we will have uh, many questions. But can I just add one, one yeah. single sentence? Uh, we, we are missing to discuss something because of time and everything, which is clinical data. 
Clinical data is crucial, for example, to distinguish between lexical roots, functional words for agrammatism or abstract versus concrete for other pathologies. We cannot discuss everything here now, but that could be another way to look at things. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there is a David Adger who wants to uh, ask a question, please. Hi guys, very brief question. Um, okay. Hi, I was teaching at a summer school a few years back um, on linguistics, uh, computer science and uh, neuroscience. And Randy Gallistel was making an argument there that basically um, the storage question that David was picking up and actually some of the computation questions were to be handled intracellularly. As a mere syntactician, I have no idea whether that's remotely plausible or not. And uh, since you guys are way more educated than that, I was just interested to know what your views were. David? I, I mean, I, it's, I mean, Randy's idea on this is at the moment, the only game in town. Yeah. yeah. Was, because it is a way to basically store digital information. The reason Randy argues that is because if you want a storage system that's content addressable and you know and sort of reserve some digitalization of the thing, we have DNA and DNA is an intracellular property and it works well. Uh, so I think it's a very cool hypothesis myself, but it raises a lot of questions like, how do you actually do that? How do you write into the cell? And then more interestingly, how do you then externalize it from itself? Because it has to actually communicate with, in, in the context of a network. So once you put stuff intracellularly, you, it, it does open a very interesting research program for how to then, you know, is it part of the exome? Where does it go? What does it mean for the modification of cellular properties? But it is a hypothesis about how you could, in principle, store strings that are ultimately content addressable. So I'm, I'm sort of positively predisposed, at least to the hypothesis. Uh, David Adger, uh, uh, thank you for this question. Actually, there is one thing that I would like to remark that should ring us a bell um, in, in the case of interpreting information. Um, but, you know, biologists taught us that uh, the DNA is full of the so-called junk portion, the junk DNA. So that's not useful. That is, quote unquote, an interpretable feature of the DNA. Then it turned out that from evolutionary point of view, the very fact that you have so much junk DNA protects you from, you know, the probability that the damage to the DNA gives you, um, a certain, you know, turns out to be a pathological reason. So one thing is for humans to understand an information. The other thing is for the machinery itself, the organism. So I think that trying to ask how the information we call language is um, implemented physically in our body is too difficult a uh, question for us. Uh, diff different question is how is morphemes and words stored? And again, the clinical data are very interesting because you have pathologists that are selectively impairing certain, times of, uh, certain types of word as opposed to others. So it must not be a total artifact. Okay, thank you. And the uh, next uh, uh, question is from Peter Svenonius. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was also uh, wondering about the storage issue. And uh, David, you said something like, well, I think people know thousands and thousands of words. We store thousands and thousands of words. But um, it seems you want to distinguish the storage of lexical roots or stems or words from the okay. syntactically relevant distinctions, this, the, the categories. And it's not clear that we store thousands of distinct functional items or, or functional ads. The number that are relevant to syntax might be much smaller. I mean, it might be in the, let's say it's in the hundreds. Uh, and I just wondered, does that, does that help? Uh, does that matter that we're well, looking I mean, for? That matters in the sense that that suggests that there are differences in kind that may have slightly you know, nuanced differences in terms of the implementation, right? So if we sort of marry in about it, uh, but it still obviously begs the question how you store any single one. So it doesn't matter to me that it's a sort of, you know, a short list of functional things of some form or the, you know, whatever, 20,000 roots that you have. You've got to show me how you store one thing. And that's very difficult already. That was, we have ideas about how spatial things are sort of encoded and maybe stored, but it's just a really hard problem. And so. Yeah. That, that's the kind of, so that's an example of maybe that distinction could be cashed out somehow and say, well, how would you store these things if you had to build computer hardware? How would you do it? 
And how would you make it so that these two things are sort of interestingly related but different? Uh, they still have to be stored in a certain way. They have to come out. I mean, remember, the good thing about what we're able to do right now is we pull out of the bag of stuff in our head every 150 milliseconds the correct item more or less barring pathology or terrible noise. Uh, that's really very impressive given how similar the elements are that make it up. Right? So phonologies across languages are not that different. And yet, as I'm speaking in this stream, uh, you're not having a brutal time getting the right item. So it's stored in a way that you can get to it with a low error rate, whether it's heard, read, touched with braille, seen in sign. So the whole list of stems or roots that you have have to be super clever in the way they are. And then here the burden is on, as David Adger was saying, the burden is on Randy Gallus to say, well, how is that then done? Writing, writing it into the tape and getting it off the tape. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, if oh, I, no, I can no, only no. add, yeah. sorry, did, did you finish or you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, the only thing I, I could add to Peter was again, see, a grammatism clearly shows you that that has to be a different kind of storage. On the other, on the other hand, um, the idea of storage reminds me the embarrassment, which is a further embarrassment, the neurobiologists in general have for memory. How, what kind, how many kinds of different memories do we have? Is it the same to, re, to, remind a num, to remember a number to, uh, you know, or other, how, how is that done? So storage and in fact, ob ob oblivion, I mean, the way we forget things is forgetting, also, yeah. forgetting is also a very interesting fact that we don't understand. And I don't think we have any uh, access to experiment, uh, you know, a linguistic experiment in that sense. Because, you know, there is a famous experiment with rats. Uh, people um, can demonstrate that when a rat reminds something, um, uh, that remembrance is stored in a, into a molecule that is destroyed and remade. This famous experiment was done by injecting the rat with something that uh, blocks the, the, you know, the formation of that molecule. So once the rat remembers it for once, then it, he's not able to remember it twice. So he gets shocked. So if memory is, is really a matter of networks, chemistry, and o o oscillation of information, then it's, it's more complex than understanding how the universe came about. But it's part of the of the magic, right? I mean, we like it, sort of. Okay, thank you. And the next question comes from Luigi Rizzi. Well, Luigi. I don't know where he Hello. is. Hi, I'm here. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm, the I'm word. Obviously, I'm here. <laughs> I'm somewhere in the universe, right? Uh, where? So. Where the, uh, my my question for, to uh, both of you is about the trade-off between uh, inventories and computations, right? So in a, in a sense, uh, uh, the contribution of modern linguistics of generative grammar has been to shift the emphasis uh, from inventories to computations, right? So mm -hmm. inventories are the easy part, let's say, and then uh, the action really. Uh, is on uh, how you compute, uh, how we compute. Uh, and uh, uh, there's also a kind of logical priority. So you've got to have a list of elements uh, for computations to apply. If one could not really understand how merge works if you didn't have elements to put together. So I was intrigued uh, by David's uh, uh, observation that uh, the real hard problem is the storage of items. If it is so, uh, how can one address computations? I mean, is it, is it good? And he seemed to suggest that uh, uh, studying computations is e in the brain is easier than studying storage. Did I understand correctly? And how can <laughs> one uh, study, uh, let's say, merge in the brain without having an idea of uh, how the elements are expressed in the brain. I mean, I, I, in, in fact, you're exactly right. I mean, my interpretation for the moment, if you ask me today, is that the storage problem is harder than the computation problem. So suppose we reduce the computation problem to one, which is what you guys do for a living, right? So there's maybe there's only one kind of computation. Uh, 
the it can be when most of what we study or what we have access to in neuroscience is some kind of processing consequence right so we probably have access to you know if this happens and this happens maybe it's you know some form of merge or maybe it's concatenation plus labeling if we decompose it somehow uh, if they are actualized as operations in a brain, if we're kind of non-dualist, then yes, you can probably find it. Maybe it's not in one location. My own hunch is it's probably something that uh, has arisen in a bunch of different parts of the head, this kind of primitive operation. But I think it's graspable. I think we're actually closer and closer. And I, I would not be surprised if in 10 years we have a really good sense of at least some of the elementary suite of operations. Uh, but I bet you, you know, that it's going to be much more difficult to have a sense of, even if we have good theories of the atoms, how the atoms are stored and pulled out. That, I think, and, and that's because it's a general problem in neuroscience, because we don't know anything about memory. We, in fact, don't know how anything is stored. All claims to the contrary notwithstanding. Right? It's just false. I mean, we have uh, sort of relatively coarse-grained metaphoric notions of that it's nets of connectivities between synapses. But if you try to actually cash that out, does that mean I know how some particular item is stored? No, the answer is actually we don't know that. So that's, the, so that's why I think systematic work on the inventory and its possible attributes and how they might be developed, uh, instantiated in neurobiological tissue is the real forefront and the hardest part. I think that, um... Uh, in fact, I, I obviously agree because, if, you know, as I, as I said before, the, the problem of memory is an unresolved one. But concerning Luigi's question, I probably said it too, in a too com com compressed way. But when I refer to Jesperson for the notion of word to be possible only if you have a notion of sentence, was a way to say that you don't get one without the other. So it doesn't seem to me that you can actually... Uh, have a framework such that it have notion of primitive and independently a notion of operation. The two must come together. To me, I mean, to my, to the way I see things, the notion of morphemes and notion of merge cannot be done in isolation. They have to be uh, considered in the, it's like the notion of predicate and subject. They have to be done simultaneously. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't pose it as a supremacy or, you know, a tendency to look at primitives as opposed to operation. Although historically, we are dealing with operation in a much more productive way, ever since the notion of transformation. But if you take, for example, um, distributed morphology, other ways of looking at things, you clearly have the idea that uh, you have to, uh, you cannot separate the two. Even um, in Ana Maria's work on, um, on the notion of word and the notion of symmetry, it's clear that the two cannot be done uh, in isolation. So, uh, but that's interesting because it could be that what you're suggesting to look at in the storage of uh, of the elements in the brain and the notion of operation, if, if you look at that in that way, maybe the notion of operation will come up in, in much clearer sense. Okay, Certainly. thank you. Uh, I have a question from Francesco Vespignani. Is he in the public and uh, does he want to speak? Otherwise, I read the question that is in the chat. So, in order to fill the gap between neurobiology and uh, formal linguistics, uh, do you see any role of cognitive uh, psychological models uh, and of behavioral data? And if yes, uh, which? I add, uh, sorry, uh, I was muted. I add, um, it seems a, a provocative question, being myself a cognitive psychologist, but I really think it, it is possible to bypass uh, ourselves. I, I would like a honest, it's not a provocation, an honest answer from the speaker. Thank you. I'm happy to give you an honest answer in an honest paper. Uh, if you want to so I, I published a paper a couple of years ago, 2017, I think, in the journal Neuron, and the title is Neuroscience Needs Behavior. Uh, so that sort of develops the argument. Uh, and so I absolutely think uh, there's room for cognitive psychological models. In fact, I, my colleagues and I argue there that it should be on 
at least equal epistemological footing, if not actually have the priority in experimental design. Right. That is, the behavioral and experiment, cognitive psychological and linguistic work should actually be the leading edge in formula. So I, we're trying to adopt a pretty kind of MAR inspired uh, research program where we say, look, the computational level in the sense of MAR has to be very well defined, which includes cognitive psychology, linguistics, kind of cognitive science and computational models. And they should be driving the neurobiological inquiry by asking the questions in a way like, okay, now I'm gonna look for a circuit that does this, that, and the other thing. So yes, there's not just room for it. It should be uh, possibly even the priority, but that's a, that's a tall order logically, as you can imagine. Not all my friends think that's a cool idea. Uh, I, I think that actually, this is not only very interesting, but it, it tells us that the, the very notion of behavioral test is not very well delimited. So for example, take a very um, simple kind of, 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 of testing like um, um, eye, um, eye tracking, which is in a sense, a measure of your behavior and the other measure of your, you know, of your capacity. That's a perfectly reasonable way to test a hypothesis. So I actually don't think you can strip away behavior from any of uh, these experiments. And in fact, I think that David does the same. Before running any experiment on neuroimaging or anything, we do test behavioral uh, capacities. Mm -hmm. You obtain a lot from that. Okay. Uh, the next question is from uh, Res Resnik or Reskin. Hi, this is Philip Resnick. Um, thanks to both of you and to uh, to the organizers for a great discussion. Um, so I'm glad David raised uh, Mar. Uh, I'm glad it came up because my question, I think, goes in that direction. I could be wrong, but a lot of the discussion seems to assume a certain level of transparency crossing from the computational to the algorithmic representational to the to the neurobiological level. And I wanted to ask about that. Um, it, it, it seems as if one could imagine alternatively a less transparent relationship. Um, uh, and uh, as I say in the, the chat when I formulated the question, um, an example, although not one I'm advocating, would be, for example, finite state approximations being implemented by the brain, even though theoretically the, the, the appropriate characterization might be um, you know, context-free or, or, or mildly context-sensitive. Uh, I'm just wondering, is this in the category of the, well, this is too hard? Is this in the category, uh, how, I mean, to what extent is, is, is the transparency an assumption? And if it's not, then how are people going about exploring the potential of non-transparency in that regard? Uh, is that, should I take a crack at that, Andrea? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. with the hard thing is too complicated for me. Yeah, yeah. It's, so uh, I have a look. Um, the, I think that the, one does not have to be Catholic about transparency there in the Mar sense, right? I mean, I think that the, uh, so my reading of that is that, you know, you can study these things at different levels and in the, in the best of all possible worlds, these levels are very tightly linked and constrained and inform each other, but there's not a reductionist relation and it doesn't actually follow that it's a totally transparent relation. So with respect to the thing of, could it be basically, for instance, uh, pre-compiled things? That's a research, pro that's a question, right? That's an empirical question. I mean, you can actually formulate it. Mm. That kind of, uh, let's say, that, that kind of model uh, is actually testable in terms of experimental psychology or psycholinguistics or neurolinguistics. So I don't think that they, I don't wanna make a, a claim about super transparency. And in fact, there are very, very few examples that I think meet that criterion. I mean, I have my favorite ones that I write about occasionally they have to do with sound localization, where we understand the entire system from soup to nuts in certain creatures, like literally from molecule to mind. But in the case of humans and more complex things, we, we stink. Uh, so maybe the relationship doesn't have to be transparent and you could have some uh, more complicated things. Still though, right? It's still a property of the brain, of the mind slash brain. Uh, I, don't, I still don't think it's that you have a, a let's say a tabula rasa mind and you see the stimulation somehow and you see, let's say hierarchical relation of some form, uh, you are able to extract exactly that feature. And then the property of the brain that instantiates that mirrors that. So that there's some kind of <coughs> real 
real correspondence between uh, features of a stimulus and features of the neural representation. That's just a little too empiricist for me as a biologist. It just doesn't make it incoherent. But yeah, um, you're right about that assumption of transparency. I think you're, I, your point is well taken. <clears throat> There's actually, I only want to make a small point about that. There was a recent uh, collection um, on the philosophical transaction of the Royal Society that asked linguists and non-linguists to consider um, uh, um, um, co combinatorial system in general um, from the eyes of the Mars you know, uh, hierarchy. And it seems to me that one of the most useful way to look at that is to confront it with a three-factor three factor, um, uh, approach by Chomsky. Because they both, have the, they both rely on the idea that something m may be inherent to the system and something may be caused by some other general properties. Pros are, are considered together, then the very notion of how is information stored becomes really more complex. And what I was trying to say by referring to the junk DNA as something that we humans don't understand by nature makes exploits it as a very useful tool to preserve um, the species uh, could tell us a lot about structures that we don't understand. One example is redundancy in language which seems to me to be there, despite the fact that we may want that to be perfect structure. Okay, I have one more question by Rita Manzini. Please, Rita. I, I, my question actually relates to about 15 minutes, to the discussion 15 minutes ago. And I was wondering, just out of curiosity, has anybody looked, uh, they must have looked at uh, phonological, phonetic uh, processing uh, and storage of those atoms, because there the problem would seem to be more easily tractable than the morphine problem. So half a comment and half a information question. Why, why do you think it's more tractable? Well, because, well, first of all, because it's easier to check on the primitives. Uh, which are physically implemented, right? And secondarily, because popularly we are taught at MIT that a phono phonology is a finite system. So it, does, it doesn't have recursion essentially. So even as a computational system, it's sort of uh, easier, right? So simpler in a very easily definable way. So, as I said, uh, you know, I'm not suggesting that yeah, it's going so, to go that way. I was just asking the question. Yeah, so I work on that kind of stuff much more because I have better intuitions about it. And I, I think, you know, uh, yes, one has access to the system because, you know, there's sort of a physical signal that you can characterize yeah. and we know a lot more about the processing, about the perception system, the action system. That being said, Still don't know that we don't know how things are stored. Let, let me actually uh, connect to a subsequent question, which I read. Idan Landau asked a question, which is, uh, so, you know, well, why don't we have the hypothesis that functional lexical atoms are different? Same thing, right? So yes, there are likely anatomic differences, you know, whether it's we're dealing with, let's say, uh, aspects of phonology or functional items. There's going to be distinctions. And yes, we can solve the maps problem, maybe. We can figure yeah. out this may be there, this may be there, this may be there. But how? The nuts and bolts of storage. We simply don't know in that case either. So that's a sort of like the example of C. elegans. Mm. Right? C. elegans, we know every cell, we know its connectome, we know its genome, we know the entire wiring diagram, but we don't know a damn about how that worm works. So it's a test bed for further experimentation. So when we have places where we can point our microscope, as a, a case may be, uh, we can then do further experimentation, whether it's about the phono phonological elements or others. But the next step is the hard one. What does it mean to store something? How does that work, right? So we yeah. can look at different places. And so for, for both of these questions, it's, uh, it's just really hard, but I'm, uh, what's good is that the discussion is yielding ideas about you know, what kind of distinctions to draw.
that might be motivating hypotheses for further investigation. And I think that's sort of the point of this kind of exercise today, right? That, that you put your cards on the table in a way like, what do you think are distinctions without which you could not have the functioning theory of whatever domain of language you work on? Right? So you owe a set of add a, you know, a set of, you know, an inventory of operations and representations that you, for you, which you have to say, I cannot live without these in order to get off the ground at all. This is sort of my conditio sine qua non. Those but, confront me with, right? Th those are the ones that see that we can get off the ground. Uh, but uh, I agree with that. I mean, whenever one raises the notion, the, the question of storage, of course, the problem is that it blows to the, the general problem of memory and, and access. But on the other hand, I want to say part of, of Rita's intuition uh, to the extent that at least with phonology, we learn two things. First, we have tonotopic that, and we don't have any equivalent for the lexicon in the brain. And second, actually, that's also part of your contribution. And actually, we know that the way they are processed, you know, that phonemes are processed in the brain follows exactly more or less the, the kind of binary feature system that was individuated uh, from a comparative point of view. So in a sense, I agree with Rita to the idea that um, uh, we are one step forward because the kind of, of, in fact, of granularity or of primitive elements that we deal with are those that can be made in correspondence with particular self properties. On the other, I also agree with you with the idea that that may indicate the procedure we analyze, the physical signal, but tells us nothing on how to rem we rem remember things. And again, how do we forget things? Because it, to me, the problem of memory is just the problem of how we forget. That's, ex that's the way I see it. That is, there has to be a selective ways that is not just totally I mean, my, so that's because you're a novelist and you think about, you know, things that, you know, you have a richer perspective on this. I'm, I'm more uh, pedestrian. When, well, I think on, that, when people say, you know, you know, when people say that are exactly the, have exactly the opposite you feeling. Know, but I mean, so you I, tell me that I am a pedestrian, will you still treat me with the dinner in Germany? You know, I'll say, I still owe you dinner. No, but I mean, so for me, it's less about the forgetting issue. It's actually the, the, the storage itself, right? So the thing that anim that is sort of animating my concern is that yeah. I simply can't get my head around how do you store it. So I am a total believer from you know my first phonology course on and distinctive features and in one way to kind of use them is using operations like analysis by synthesis ideas I learned in class many years ago that I think are absolutely kick-ass amazing and I believe yeah. they're on the right track or they're wrong in an interesting way and they uh, so. But it doesn't solve the problem, right? So I know exactly where to look. I have pretty good intuitions about where in the brain, what is going on and how these things are aligned. But it, honestly, for, for that too, even though there's a physical system that I can measure and I can link it to other things, doesn't mean I know how the thing is stored. You got, I, so I, agree. I, I can understand that there's a resistance to this idea because we no. do it and it works. Uh, I was not suggesting that you would know, you would know the answer. I was just asking you whether yeah, yeah, no, no, you're right. I mean, I think it might. So I, I, I of course, uh, do think it's easier. That's why I work on that system the most, because I think it, it, maybe it'll work. But I don't think it, I don't think uh, that being said, that it actually gets us over the last hump of the hardest part of the question. And the hardest part of the question, maybe, you know, maybe we're just asking it wrong. You know, maybe we're just thinking about it the wrong way. I mean, sometimes I think, well, maybe we should be asking people who build computers like hardware architecture kind of mm -hmm. question. How would you do it so that you write something into this register? What's, what's a clever that, way to- That's the only thing I, I would not agree. That's the only thing I would not agree with. You know, when they sell phones, this phone to be sold contains something that is called neural engine. Mm -hmm. I bet no one there <laughs> knows, it, not, not even how to draw a possible neural. But that's the way it works. You see what the Musk right. did few weeks ago they they t told us they 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 know how to to implant in the brain things that will easily uh, go up to memories languages and everything this is a fraud mm -hmm. and and it is business and we have to defend it our community 
the linguist have to defend against engineers and many other who uh, misunderstand the situation and think about simulation as a model, whereas it's completely different. Yeah, so I mean, my so I, I, I'm not advocating here that we just you know wholeheartedly embrace what modern computational techniques do. That's it's just that for this particular question, I mean, there has been a lot of research. And I wonder if one can capitalize on some of the things and see if we can translate those to hypotheses that we can investigate, right? So because people who build these things, you know, have successfully built them. Yes. So maybe we can learn something from that and say, huh, okay, cool. So that's how that's done. Maybe we can yes. design it as a study to probe with the tools we have, right? So, yes. so like, I mean, with respect to the thing of computational systems we have right now, take our favorite problem as cognitive scientists of language, the poverty of the stimulus, right? So that has very different, so if you're a computer okay. science person, yeah. say poverty of the stimulus is a shitty argument because there's, if I have a big enough corpus and I have fancy statistics, yeah. I can get almost anything. But, but That's but, not an interesting notion of poverty. And we're, we're, we're worrying about like, given the reasonable amount of data that a kid has and a mind or a yeah. mind brain, is it a solvable problem? That's a more parochial and tricky issue. And this is exactly the reason why such, you know, big uh, projects like the Human Brain Project practically failed. Yeah, they've been pretty silly. Yes, yeah. but that's the. This was one of the two flagship projects in the European for twenty-three years, for uh, ten years, twenty-three uh, different countries put one billion three hundred million euros into this project of building an artificial brain because we know the mathematics uh, based on big data, our money. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. I think uh, we have uh, to stop uh, here. And uh, so thank you to our speaker and to everyone who attended. And I give the floor to Cecilia for Grazie, Teresa. updating. Bye. Well, thank you, everybody, for making the discussion so interesting tonight. I just want to announce our next flash mob. It's held always on Thursday, on the 24th of September, always at the same time. And this time we have Yancy Simply and Antonella Sorace, uh, who will debate about second language acquisition. I hope to see you all either on Zoom or on YouTube in two weeks. All the best. Thank you for hosting. Thank you, Cecilia, and the organizers, and everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. So long, it was very fun. Bye, Andrea. Thank you for bye joining. Bye. Oh, I will bye bye. <laughs> bye. Where? I owe you a dinner, probably. <laughs> Me, no. <laughs> ciao, Memo. Ciao, Luigi. Ciao, tutti. Ciao, Andrea. Ti scrivo. <laughs> ciao, ragazzi. Ciao, Peter. I like to see you. I won't leave. Ciao, ragazzi. <laughs> <laughs> Anna Maria, David. Ciao, Andrea. Gemma, Memo, Thomas. <laughs> Andrea, can you just stay for a minute? Yes. Um, oh, it's a pleasure seeing you all. And thank you, David. That was I very hope, interesting. I hope we made a little bit of sense. You know. David, have a safe trip back. And if yeah, I look forward to being there.